Amen. All right, Genesis chapter number 21. Let's look down there at verse number 1. The Bible reads, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. I, I love the way this is written. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said. Basically, you know, God said this, exactly what God said, he did it. He visited Sarah as he had spoken. Every time God speaks, you could just take it to the bank. You know that it's true. We have no need to doubt, no need to worry, no need to wonder. He says, just like God said, he did it. And of course, what they're talking about is Sarah um, giving birth to Isaac. Because if you remember um, back in the previous chapter, I think it was chapter, um, was it maybe this chapter 20? When he said, according to this time, according to the time of life, you know, I'll visit you and you'll have a son. And that's exactly what he did. So about um, a year later, this is, this is what happens. Verse number two, for Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time at which God had spoken to him. So it's exactly the way that God had laid out. He visits her and she conceives and she has a son. Verse three, and Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And what we see here then is Abraham is also an upright man. God's doing everything according to his word and what he says. And we see Abraham likewise following God according to what God says. Like God says, you need to stay, circumcise your son on the eighth day. He said when he told him before, hey, you need to be circumcised a few chapters back. You know, Abraham was um, 99. And Ishmael was 13. And um, that's when God, you know, gave him the covenant of circumcision and, and, you know, made those promises to him. And he got circumcised. And now we see here the, that God had also told him that the, his son needed to be circumcised on the eighth day, which is later also um, explained or, or, or given by the law of Moses. Moses also, when, he's, when, when all of the laws established in the Mosaic law, this is also one of those same laws. Now, we don't necessarily know how much Abraham knew of these laws. I mean, obviously, he knew about this one, and he knew about other laws um, and, and you know, doing animal sacrifices and things like that. But it's not all necessarily recorded exactly what he knows. And this is going to come important, actually, a little bit later at the end of the chapter. But just keep that in mind. We see here that he... Um, he performs the, the circumcision as he's supposed to, the same way as in the law of Moses, on the eighth day, because Abraham's a faithful man, and he does what God's commanding him to do. Verse number five, And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck for I have borne him a son in his old age. And, you know, I just want to point out this great miracle of Sarah being 90 years old and giving birth to a child because it's very clear from the scripture here that not only did she conceive, which it was already past the manner of women with her, not only was she able to conceive seed and have a, and have a son, she also her body also was able to produce milk to be able to, to, to feed, to nurse her child. And we see that's very clear because she said, um, who would have said on Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck? So giving your child suck is nursing your child. She's like, who would have said that? You know, I'm 90 years old. Who in the world would have thought that I could be a nurse to a, to a child? right? It's, it's nobody in the world would have thought that. But this is one of the great miracles that God performs in the birth of Isaac. That's why he's the son of promise. And we'll get into that in just a minute. Let's keep reading here. Verse number eight. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. So there's this big celebration. He throws a party that I think one of the reasons, you know, God allowed Sarah to be able to provide nourishment and sustenance for this child all the way up until the, the, the child would naturally be weaned from having to rely on mom's milk. And that's a, I mean, it's a great day. It's a, it's a, it's a step. It's an accomplishment in the life of Isaac. So Abraham throws his party, right? 
let's keep reading here. Verse number nine, and Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, so she's talking about Ishmael, which she had bare born unto Abraham mocking. So she sees Ishmael. Ishmael is 14 years old at this point when Isaac's born. This 14-year-old boy, Ishmael, so he starts mocking. Right? We don't know exactly what he's doing, but probably mocking something about Sarah being so old, you know, and, and this baby, you know, no longer nursing or whatever. He's mocking the whole event, right? And she gets upset about this. She sees this. This kind of angers her. Come sit down right now. And we'll keep reading here. He says in verse, if it says in verse 10, Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. So she goes to Abraham and is like, kick this bondservant out. You know, let's, let's, let's get her out of here, get her son out of there. Because you remember, the only reason why Ishmael was even born is because they had that lapse of faith where Sarah gave her handmaid, Hagar, unto Abraham to be his wife, to, to, to be able to, to produce a child that, that Sarah would be able to raise as her own. The only reason that this, this ever even happened was so that she could be like a surrogate mother, right? To, to be someone that can, that can bear a child for Abraham because they were both so old. But now, Sarah had the child that was promised to them to begin with. And now it's like, they don't need him anymore. And actually, if you remember, that whole event that took place, that already caused problems with, with her being the handmaid and stuff because... Hagar then, Sarah was despised in Hagar's eyes. And we saw that a few chapters back. I preached on that. And nothing good ever comes of these situations when you start messing with marriage, you start messing with all this kind of stuff and, and trying to do things in the flesh and in the way that you understand instead of relying on God, especially when it comes to having children. You know, people always want to, to tamper with, with God's design and God's plan and try to, try to take you know, nature, if you will, or God's plan into your own hands. And nothing good ever comes of that. There's always um, repercussions, things that happen as a result when you decide to just, to just forget, forget praying or waiting on God and not having faith in Him and just doing things your own way causes extra problems. And this caused a lot of problems. I'm not going to re-preach that sermon, but we saw all the problems that happened when when. Hagar was given unto Abraham and then it causes this friction and this strife and now there's this you know the the women don't get along anymore and Hagar wasn't respecting Sarah who Sarah was basically her boss Hagar was the servant and and Sarah was her master and her mistress and she was you know supposed to be following her and there's a whole mess that came of that so now we get to the point Sarah sees Ishmael mocking and she's like I've had enough of this let's just get her out of here you know I don't want her around and also, there was the issue of Ishmael really being the firstborn of Abraham. Now, not the legitimate firstborn because Sarah was Abraham's wife, but he was Abraham's firstborn child. So she's like, he's not going to be heir. My son is the heir. Isaac is the heir. He's the one that's going to receive the inheritance. We need to just send him away because I don't want there to be any more problems with any disputes, with anything like that, you know, everything is going to Isaac because he is, he is the heir of our inheritance. And so they want to send, she wants to send him away. And this grieves Abraham. This makes Abraham kind of sad. He's kind of sorry. Look at verse number um, 11. And the thing was very grievous unto, in Abraham's sight because of his son. So he's not worried about Hagar. You know, he has, he has no, it's not like he loves Hagar and he wants her to stick around. It's because of his son. He's worried, you know, he, he cares for his son. And he always has. And we saw this in other chapters as well where Abraham truly does care because it is his son. He, he loves Ishmael and he cares about him. So he doesn't want to just send him off. But look at what God says. God confirms what Sarah says here. In verse number 12, the Bible reads, And God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman in all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice for an Isaac shall thy seed be called. So he says, everything that Sarah just said to you, listen to her. She's right. Send him out. And he's like, don't be sorry 
because of your son. Don't, don't, you know, don't worry about that. This is what's right. Isaac is, is, is the legitimate heir, and he's where your seed's going to be called from. Verse 13 says, And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. So he's saying, you know, he's trying to comfort him. He said, look, I'm going to make a nation out of him. Don't worry about them. Ishmael will be just fine, but you need to get him out of here. Because he is not the legitimate son. He's not the child of promise. Isaac is. Sarah's right. You need to get them out. Now, turn if you would. We're going to keep our... We're going to come back to this in a while. Um, so you don't need to keep your place in Genesis 21 necessarily. Go to Galatians chapter 4. Because this, this event is referenced about the um, Hagar and her son being cast out in Galatians chapter 4. And if you would also put a, a bookmark or something in Revelation 21, because we're going to be going there next, and um, we're going to be sticking in Galatians 4. I'm going, to, I'm going to go through this New Testament teaching. See, what's great about the New Testament is it shines so much light on a lot of these stories in the Old Testament. You know, you read through this stuff and you might not be able to pick up exactly why is this all being told in the Bible. Why are these details in here? Why, why does the Bible you know, record all of this stuff about Isaac being born and then Hagar and Ishmael being kicked out and all this other stuff? Well, there's a very important reason for that. In Galatians chapter 4, helps us to understand what that reasoning is. If you're in Galatians chapter 4, we're going to start reading in verse number 21, where the Bible reads, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. This is exactly what I was explaining. When they took matters into their own hands, the son of the bondwoman, the son of Hagar, that is after the flesh. That was their own mentality, their own way of figuring out how Abraham can have a son. That's the best they were able to do was to, was to basically commit adultery by giving Abraham this other woman to have a child for him. That's the result of their works, their best effort, right? But Isaac, he was the son of the free woman. Sarah is the free woman, and he was by promise. God had promised to give them a son. And that son came through Sarah legitimately, not through anybody else. He was the son of promise. So this is where we're at, right? I mean, this is exactly what we're covering in the book of Genesis. Look at verse 24. Which things are an allegory? So it ex explains immediately, like these things... What it is, it's an allegory, it's a story, it's, it's, it's an illustration. It's here to let you know another truth. And let's see what that is. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Now, what I point out is it says these things are an allegory. So there's two different things that it's demonstrating. And what it says they are are the two covenants, right? The first covenant was the law, obedience to the law, right? Salvation through the law, which no one was able to attain. That was the old covenant. That was the old promise, the old deal. Okay, if you can listen, if you can obey my commandments, if you could do all of this stuff, then you'll be righteous. Nobody can do that. Whereas the other covenant is the covenant of Jesus Christ, the covenant of, of a free gift of salvation through faith. And um, that's what this whole story is representing here. And I want to point out here in verse 25 where it says, for this Agar, it's talking about Hagar, just Hagar without the H um, in Greek. Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth, to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. And why is Jerusalem in bondage with her children? Because they're still trusting in the law. They're, they're in bondage, right? So you have the, the illustration of the bond woman, which is Hagar. She's in bondage because she's not totally free. She's a servant for Sarah and Abraham. She is their servant. She serves them. She's in bondage, so to speak, of them. That's why she's a bond maid, right? She's not, she wasn't completely free. She had to serve them. 
And that's an allegory pointing to, you know, Jerusalem, which now is at that time was made up major primarily of Jews who didn't believe Jesus Christ. They rejected Jesus Christ and they were trusting in the law. They were trusting in the works of the law for their salvation. That's in bondage. And anybody today who's trusting in their own good works to be saved is in bondage. You're in bondage of the law. You're, you're, you're under the curse of the law because nobody can keep it. As opposed to the, the covenant of the free woman, the covenant of that free gift. Let's keep looking at this, but look at what it says in verse 26. So now it has, you know, the Jerusalem which now is, is in bondage, right? But, verse 26, but Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. So, He's, he's pointing out a difference between the physical Jerusalem that's here on this earth and the Jerusalem up in heaven. And this is what gets so many people mixed up about the Jews, about Bible prophecy, about, about all kinds of things in the Bible because they fail to recognize there are two Jerusalems today. One is physical. One would be carnal or fleshly or in bondage. The people who rely on genealogies and other things not of faith, not by promise. That is the physical nation of Jerusalem that we even have today. When the Bible is talking about covenants and promises, it's not talking about that Jerusalem. It's talking about the heavenly Jerusalem because that's where the promises are from. And that will be what we are going to see one day. I, had, I told you to keep a finger in Revelation 21. Keep your finger still here in Galatians 4. We're coming back to it. Flip over to Revelation 21. Because I want you to see this, because this is talking about Jerusalem, which is above, is free. And we're going to read a little bit more from Revelation 21 about the free Jerusalem, about the new Jerusalem that most of the Bible prophecy is talking about that people get so confused about. Revelation chapter 21, second to last chapter in the entire Bible, starting in verse number one, the Bible says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So this is after the, tribula the great tribulation. This is after God pours out his wrath. This is after the millennial reign of Christ. Okay, now I'm saying like, I see a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, the old heaven, old earth has passed away. It's done away with. Um, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Verse 2, And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. And what a glorious day that'll be to be in that new Jerusalem. And see, this is after everything because even during the millennial reign of Christ, there is still that final last battle where the devil is loosed out of, out of hell for a season. And there's the battle of Gog and Magog, you know, and they, and they gather from the four corners of the earth, um, you know, just at the end of the millennial reign of Christ to come and do that one last battle where basically God just destroys them without, without any battle at all. Like, he just wipes them out. Just from the, with, the, with the words out of his mouth, he just, just wipes them out as if they're nothing. And this is now the new Jerusalem. There's no more death. There's no pain. There's no sorrow. There's no crying. There's none of that. Because now, finally, all of the sin is just wiped out. It's stamped out completely. And... Um, this is what the Jerusalem that we're looking forward to. So we sang that song right before the, uh, before the preaching, Mar we're marching to Zion, right? That beautiful, beautiful Zion, the, um, um, the holy city of God. This is that city that's referenced in that song. This is what we're talking about. This is what we as Christians are looking forward to is that new Jerusalem. And this is the Jerusalem that was referenced in Galatians chapter 4. Flip back, if you would, to Galatians 4. I just wanted to point this out real briefly to kind of give you an idea of what is that new Jerusalem we're talking about because we have more information from Revelation 21. Jump back to Galatians chapter 4 real quick. Because that Jerusalem which is above is free. That's received as a free gift. 
If you're saved, you receive that inheritance for free. It says, which is the mother of us all. Look at verse 27 of Galatians 4. Keeping that in mind, but Jerusalem which is above is free. And, and he shows the difference between the physical Jerusalem and the, and the heavenly Jerusalem, which is the mother of us all. For it is written. So he's continuing on with the same thought. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now I want to, real quickly, and, and try to stay with me here, you know, it, it's sometimes it's more difficult to sit through the preaching than it is to, to study this out on your own. But, but hopefully um, you, can, you can stay with me here because these are all related. And anytime you're studying the Bible, it's always important. If you want to know a lot more about what this is talking about, and that's why we're digging in real deep. See, we started with the story in Genesis about just Abraham and, um, and Ishmael and Isaac, right, being born. Ishmael, the bondwoman's son. And, and Isaac being the free woman. Son. And, and we're looking at the same exact story from Galatians light, the light of Galatians 4. And then from Galatians 4, hey, it references this new Jerusalem, which is important because then it's talking about, um, it makes a quote from the Old Testament. We need to understand what the new Jerusalem is he's talking about. The Jerusalem which is above. And then Galatians 4.27 quotes Isaiah 54. So turn, if you would, to Isaiah 54. Anytime you see a quote, like here it said, for it is written, and then, and then it quotes the Old Testament. If you really want to learn more about whatever it is they're talking about, Isaiah 54, if you want to learn more about it, then um, go to these quotes. Find out, figure out where they're referencing. And it will help you to understand that much more the chapter that you're reading about. I mean, Jesus Christ did it a lot. He quoted the Old Testament. It, it's, I mean, it's all throughout the New Testament. There's, there's all these quotes from the Old Testament. And when you can read these and then read them in context, that'll help you understand the Old Testament as well as the New Testament that much better. Because why are they quoting this stuff? Well, because it has meaning. Because that's what he's talking about. And this is the prophecies we see. Isaiah 54, we're, gonna, we're actually going to read the entire chapter. Let me get there myself because I don't have the whole thing in my notes. Isaiah 54. Verse number 1 starts off with that quote. So the quote from the New Testament was, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. So just on the surface, this is, this is good news, right? This is good news for those women, for those people who didn't even have any children, right? Because children are a joy. They're a blessing. It's happiness to have children, to be, to, to be blessed with having children. And what this is saying is saying, hey, look, rejoice. Those of you that are barren, that haven't had any children, rejoice. Those of you that are desolate, which is basically saying the same thing, you don't have any children, you have no heirs left unto you, rejoice, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. They're saying, and, and we're going to see why you get to rejoice. What is this talking about? Why would I be so happy? How can you have more children than someone who has a, hu a husband if you don't have any of your own children? Because obviously this isn't talking about physical children. Look at the, the same quote, Isaiah 54 verse 1 says, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tents and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. And he's saying, you know, make, make more room and, you know, get a bigger house. He's always saying, enlarge your tent for all the children, right, that, that, that you're going to have. Verse 3, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded. For thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. 
the God of the whole earth shall he be called. And if you remember in Revelation 21, it, it called the new Jerusalem the bride adorned for her husband. Right? And now here we see, for thy maker is thine husband. Right? Talking about God being the husband. And we see the new Jerusalem is, is that bride that comes down out of heaven. And uh, as a lot, like a lot of people say, it's the church. No, it's the new Jerusalem is the bride, according to, to the Bible. Is the bride that's adorned for the husband. And it says, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. Verse 6, for the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth when thou wast refused, saith thy God. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. Verse number um, 10. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and lay thy foundations with sapphires. And I will make thy windows of agates, and thy gates of carbuncles, and all thy borders of pleasant stones. And he starts making this description, which if you were to continue reading in Revelation 21, he's talking about the gates, and the stones, and the heavenly Jerusalem, and the streets paved with gold. It's like clear glass, and, you know, and all of the beauty of it. And we're seeing again the same context here. The same, the same thing as it's talking about. So if you want to know what Isaiah 54 is talking about, match it up with Revelation 21. It's talking about the, the, the city that's adorned for her husband. And, um, and it gives a great description here of that new Jerusalem. Verse 13 says, And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear. Um, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. We're going to have safety and, and solace and solitude, and God is going to be teaching our children. You know, God's going to be the one teaching people directly. Verse 15, Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the, wa the waster to destroy no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Now I believe when it says, you know, why can you rejoice even if you didn't have any children? Because if you are a soul winner, if you're doing the works of God, you are reproducing spiritually and all of those people. Those people, when, when you win someone to Christ, it's very biblical to say that they are your son or your daughter in the faith because you are bringing forth that child. I mean, the Apostle Paul even said, I travel in birth till, you know, till Christ be formed in you. And um, he calls Timothy my son. Now, was he his physical son? No, Paul wasn't even married. He was his son in the faith because he's the one that got him saved. You know, when you get somebody else saved, when you get someone else to, to trust on Jesus Christ and you point them to him and they get saved as a result of what you did, that is like your child in the faith. And when we are in heaven, when we get to this heavenly Jerusalem, all of those people are going to be with you and you can, it'll be a day of rejoicing. You'll get to see all of the people whose lives you've touched and impacted and, and people who got saved as a result of your efforts of going out and doing God's work to where you can rejoice. And even if you never had any children by, by the amount of children that, that are produced a, as a result of this, this spirit, spiritually speaking. And I don't mean spirit babies like the, the Mormons are talking about. I mean real souls of, of, of people and adults and people that you talk to in this lifetime that, that you will see later on um, in this new place. So I thought that was, that was, it's always good. You could learn a little bit more about these things when you go back and, and go to these references that are, that are 
um, being quoted in the New Testament. So let's go back to Galatians 4, and we're going to finish up the explanation of the allegory of um, Ishmael and Isaac. Okay? Galatians 4, and then we'll flip back over to Genesis again after we get through this. Galatians 4. Let's pick up in verse number 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. I want to know what point is out real quick. He says, now we, brethren. Who is he speaking to? The churches of Galatia, as Galatians 1 says. It was written to the churches of Galatia. Now Galatia is not of Israel. Right? It's not the, descend, the physical descendants of Israel. He's talking to Gentiles. But he calls them brethren. And he says, For we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children, the children of promise. The very children of promise that's referenced back in Genesis from Abraham. Sit up. Those very children that are referenced. Take them back. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. It's not talking about the physical seed of Abraham. This is not talking about the Jews, so to speak. He's saying, even as Gentiles, we are the children of promise. We, have re we are the children of that inheritance because of their faith. But let's keep reading here, verse 29. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. So just as... Um, you know, those, you say it's the same way those that are born after the flesh persecute those, those that are of the world persecute those that are of God. And it's always been that way and always be that way. Um, verse number 30, Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. This is what brings us all, ties it all together to where we were just reading. That's the exact quote that we read that Sarah wanted, the bondwoman cast out. So then, brethren, we are not the children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So, the world is not going to inherit the earth, right? The heavenly Jerusalem is the inheritance that we are promised through faith. That is what we are going to get. The whole story of Isaac and Ishmael is an allegory to teach us a greater truth. And that's what it said in Galatians 4 earlier. It's an allegory. Hagar, think about this. Hagar was an Egyptian servant, right? She was the bondwoman. Now, Egypt is always representative of the unsaved world in the Bible. I mean, you could go through this just symbolically. Egypt is the world. You know, God says not to rely on the horses of Egypt. Don't, don't go back into Egypt. You know, he's delivered them out of the bondage of Egypt. And, and even when the children of Israel were, were brought into bondage, right? God, with a, with a high arm and a, stre with a stretch out arm and a high hand, delivered them from that bondage and basically told them not to return into Egypt. Egypt is never viewed in a positive light in the Bible. It's always something negative. The bondwoman was from Egypt. So symbolically, she's of the world. She's what the world has to produce. And the son of, of the Egyptian woman was the son of the flesh, the works of the flesh, and the obedience of the law is what, is what that's all being symbolized as. And um, whereas Isaac was, of course, the child of promise. And what I love about that is no matter how impossible the promises may seem to fulfill, God fulfills them every single time. As we start off, even in verse 1 of, of Genesis 21, you know, as he said, God, you know, Sarah conceived as he said. He came unto her and exactly the way that he said it is the way it happened. And, you know, you think of Sarah giving birth and weaning a child at 90 years old. We look at that and think of that as being, you know, humanly speaking, we look at that and be like, that's impossible. The world is definitely going to tell you that's impossible. Sci you know, science is going to say, no way, that can't happen. Physically impossible. Oh, you already passed age. Oh, you have you have already you know um, you know stopped having the the manner of women as the Bible puts it, right? There's no way you could have a child. 
it's too late. You're 90 years old, yeah, your body is not going to be able to produce the milk needed to nurse your child. Yeah. Well, according to the world, impossible, but according to God, hey, nothing's too hard for the Lord. All things are possible through God. And, and He loves doing these things to, to bring that much more glory and honor unto God because He's the true God. He's all-powerful. And this is how he, one of the ways He makes his, his magnificence and His might known unto us so we don't get too caught up into the physical world of thinking this is all impossible. Because it's not. Because with God, all things are possible. Amen. Or you think about like Jesus coming. In the, uh, in the end times and revenging the blood of the martyrs. So the Antichrist is going to come into power and just physically speaking, fleshly speaking, you know, he's coming after, he's making war with the saints and he's defeating them all. And he's saying, if you don't take the mark of the beast, you know, you're going to be put to death. And everybody's on board with this Antichrist, essentially. Just about everybody. I mean, they've accepted him. You know, he's making these lying signs and wonders and all these people are deceived by the Antichrist. So for us, it looks hopeless, right? It looks like there is, it's going to look like there is, I mean, we're done for. And then, of course, at that moment, the last moment, when, when everything looks like it's, like it's impossible and everything's lost, Jesus Christ is going to come down again, and he's going to save those that remain. And um, he's going to remain true to his word. Now, all of this that we see is a picture of our salvation and the inheritance of the promises. We cannot attain our salvation through our flesh or through the law, right? It must be by faith. Isaac was the seed of promise, while Ishmael was the seed of the flesh of the Egyptian that Bon made. And they were cast out from that story to show this greater truth. The whole reason for this story being in the Bible of them being kicked out was to help us to understand our salvation by faith. That when God makes a promise, He's true to that promise and that that is the only way. That is the only acceptance that God sees. The inheritance is not going to come at all through your best efforts, through your physical means. It can only come through God's way, through believing His promises and by having faith in Him. Ishmael got zero part of that inheritance. And for a reason, because it's explaining that that was the way of the works. That's the obedience. To, and, and in Galatians 4, it's referencing, you know, obedience to the law. So it brings up being in bondage to the law and, and, and going back to being justified by the works of the law instead of by the hearing of faith. And um, that's what most people struggle with is that, that bondage of being under the law versus just being a child of promise, which is what you are if you're saved by faith today. Okay, let's go all the way back to Genesis 21. And continue reading here. So God tells Abraham to, to listen to Sarah. He says, okay, you know, go ahead and do that because the bondwoman, um, you know, the, the, the son of the bondwoman is not going to be heir. Verse number 14. It says, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. So he sends them off. He gives them some food, some bread, and some water and sends them on their way. And verse 15 says, And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs, and she went and sat down over against him a good way off, as it were a bowshot. For she said, Let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. So now she kind of feels hopeless, right? She doesn't know where to go. She ran out of food. She ran out of water. And now she's like, Well, we're just going to die here out in the wilderness. Because she knows she can't go back. And so she sticks her son over in one area, you know, under a bush. She's like, okay, you, you know, you stay here. And she goes like a bow shot. So, you know, however many hundred yards you can shoot a bow. And she's like, I don't want to see him die. 
I just want to be separate from him. And she's crying and weeping and, you know, real sad. Look at verse 17. It says, And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. And again, God had made the promises to Abraham and um, to Hagar earlier about her son. So, again, this requires faith in God, you know, to not, you know, we shouldn't be hopeless in these situations. We shouldn't have to, to worry about doing things according to the flesh because God will remain true to his word. And I actually think, I believe firmly that Ishmael was saved. Now, we know, we, we, we saw that Ishmael was going to be a wild man, and it was prophesied that every man's hand was going to be his and his against everyone else's. And, um, you know, we understand that as a nation, you know, the nations that came out of him, there was always conflict and strife between the, the, you know, Israel and his seed. But Ishmael himself as an individual, I believe he was saved. And one of the reasons because, you know, Abraham was a godly man. Abraham was the man that God said he knew he would instruct his household in the ways of the Lord. He was, God was confident in Abraham's ability to teach and to train his house and everything else. And if Abraham that much had let that much love for his son that, you know, he didn't want to cast him out and all this other stuff, and we've seen in a couple places, you think he would have given him the gospel by the age 14 and gotten him saved. I believe that. But not only that, we see here, God heard the voice of the lad. He says God heard his voice. God hears our prayers when we're saved. He's going to hear that prayer that, that, that Ishmael was making to God because God heard his voice. And it doesn't hear he heard his voice. He didn't hear him crying or upset or anything, which, I mean, maybe, maybe or not he was upset, but he heard the voice of the lad. And then he comes down. I believe that Ishmael was saved um, as a person. Now his descendants, again, that's a, that's a whole other story. But I think as a person, Abraham probably got him saved. But um, God then, uh, the angel of the Lord speaks to Hagar out of heaven and says, you know, what's the matter? Well, what's wrong with you, Hagar? What, what aileth you? And he says, fear not. So he's trying to comfort Hagar. For God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Verse 18 Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. So it's kind of interesting that this well of water was already there. And God just, and she didn't see it. But then God opens up her eyes, and it's like, oh, look, there's water right there. And um, then she was able to have, to, to, Obviously, not didn't have to die because they had enough water. It says, and God was with the lad, and he grew. And see, again, God was with the lad. Another reason why I believe he was saved. Why would God be with him and blessing him and stuff if he wasn't? God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. So Ishmael, you know, they 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 just are dwelling out in the wilderness and they, they make themselves a place to live whatever and he becomes an archer and he's able to hunt and provide food. And verse 21 says, and he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. And I bet you that is probably where a lot of his problems came from because she gave him a what Now that's where her homeland was from so it kind of makes sense but getting him a wife out of Egypt probably wasn't the best idea and we know that um, strange wives in the Bible will have a tendency to turn man's, men's heart away, just like Solomon's heart was turned away with his many strange wives and started to even serve false gods and false idols. And um, that could be one of the problems with Ishmael right there. But um, we don't really learn a whole lot more about Ishmael and the rest of his life from the scripture. That's about all we have. But um, let's keep reading here, verse 22. And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the chief captain of the host, spake unto Abraham, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. And so they could see, I mean, this is obvious to Abimelech that um, God's blessing him. They said, we see God's with you. And remember, Abimelech's the one that had the dream because he had taken Sarah just like a year prior. And um, he didn't know that they were married because he said that they were brother and sister. But they can see, you know, and God came to him in a dream, he's like, look, you're a dead man. <laughs> you don't give Abraham his wife back. And he's like, whoa, you're like, I didn't know, you know, like, like, don't kill me, God, and, you know, whatever he is. 
He, God tells them that Abraham's going to have to pray for him and everything else. And um, so that experience had already happened. But they see here that, you know, obviously God is with Abraham. Abraham's living a righteous life. God just keeps blessing him. So they see this, and they don't want to have any problems, especially after that, that interaction with God in a, in a vision, in a dream. They don't want to have any problems with Abraham. So he comes to him. He says in verse 23, Now therefore swear unto me here by God that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son, but according to the kindness that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me and to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. So he's saying, look, I've been real nice to you since you've been here. I didn't hurt you. I didn't do anything. And in fact, Abimelech did give him, you know, um, oxen and things like, you know, he, he did bless him with stuff after that whole incident. So he's like, look, I've been nice to you. Now I want you to promise me here before God that you are not going to treat me bad. You're not going to do anything wrong because he's growing too. So he's becoming more of a force to be reckoned with anyways. So Abimelech's doing the, the wise thing here of, of making sure that he's going to be on the good side of Abraham and that nothing bad's going to happen. He's not going to look at him and try to conquer him or something. So, um, so that's what he's doing. Verse 24, it says, And Abraham said, I will swear. He says, okay, I'll make an agreement with you. Verse 25 says, And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. So he's saying, okay, I'll make that deal with you. But, you know, there was a, you know, because he's saying, I haven't done anything to you. I've been all nice to you and stuff since you've been here and you've been sojourning in the land. So Abraham's like, well, I think I need to bring this up because, you know, your guys violently took away one of the wells that I dug. You know, I dug this well and your guys came and, and took it by force. And it's interesting because it shows a little bit of the character of Abraham as well. That um, well, we'll keep reading here. It says, And Abimelech said, I what not who hath done this thing. He's saying, I don't know who did this. Neither didst thou tell me, neither yet heard I of it but today. So Abimelech's saying, look, I didn't even know this happened. You didn't come and tell me about this. This is the first I am hearing of this matter. So we see a little bit, though, that Abraham, he didn't make a big stink out of it. You know, someone did him wrong, but it looks like he showed a little bit of grace. He showed a little bit of forgiveness. Now, when Abimelech comes saying, you know, I haven't done anything bad to you, okay, well, yeah, you did. You know, your guys took my well away. He said, I'll make that agreement with you. You know, he wasn't holding that over his head, but he still needed to reprove him. He needed to tell him, like, this is what happened. You know, you guys took my well away. Is this what's going to continue? You know, basically saying, I expect this not to continue to happen when we make this agreement, you know. And it says in verse 27, And Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them unto Abimelech, and both of them made a covenant. So they agreed. You know, they're not going to aggress against each other. They're going to live peaceably. Verse 28, And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What mean these seven ewe lambs which thou hast set by themselves? And he said, For these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. Wherefore he called the that place Beersheba, because there they swear, both of them. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech rose up, and Phi called the chief captain of his host, and they returned in the land of the Philistines. So he's saying, like, what, what are these seven lambs doing over here? Because he sees them, they're all separated off by themselves. Like, what are those doing here? It's like, well, this is a witness. Because he's like, give them those you know, lambs that I dug this well, and, and, and settling the dispute once and for all, and saying that you are going to recognize this is my well, and you're not going to take it from me. And we'll see later as we get into later chapters, like in chapter 26, I think, where Isaac then still is having problems over these wells that are dug. And you think about it, you know, these days, again, with our technology and with the, with the plumbing and the ac and, and the aqueducts and canals and all this different, you know, infrastructure that's been built to get water in various places, it's not as big of a deal. But back in this day, when there wasn't so much infrastructure, it's a real big deal. I mean, that, that well of water is a, is, a, is a great resource, obviously, to use for, to be able to, to cultivate crops and to, do, you know, and, and to do lots of things with. So it was very valuable to have a well of water. It was a big deal. I mean, it's a lot of work to dig a well, especially when you don't have the drills and stuff to go down and do it for you like we have these days. 
um, digging that well and, and, and laying, you know, putting in the stone and mortar and everything else that you would need to, to make that well. And I don't know all the details of it, but I know it's a lot of work. And um, this is something that, that, you know, it's kind of a big deal. But he settled that. And we see Abimelech's people don't really respect that very much in the future like, like Abraham does. You know, Abraham is a man of his word. And this is the way a Christian ought to be. Someone who believes in God ought to be someone who's a man of their word. And you ought to be upright. Just like when God makes a promise, you can trust it to be true. God was able to trust Abraham when he commanded him to do things. Just like he, he, he circumcised his, house, his whole household. He circumcised Isaac when he was eight days old. He did exactly what, it, what God had told him to do. We ought to have that same type of a testimony. Our word ought to matter. So if we make an agreement with someone, we ought not to be like the Abimelechs of the world where, you know, oh, their people don't really respect that agreement. We, that we, we do and that we'll honor it. And um, we're living in an upright way. So let's finish up here, verse 33. It says, And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned in the Philistines land many days. Now I'm just going to close on this last point. It says here, Abraham planted a grove. I don't think it was right for him to do that. And this is why I wanted you to remember when I pointed out earlier, we don't know everything that God had laid out for Abraham to know. All like which of the, the laws and the commandments that he expected Abraham to follow. But every other usage of the word grove in the Bible, all negative. It's all people building groves to worship mostly false idols and false gods. Now, obviously Abraham wasn't doing that, but sometimes the people worshiped God in those groves and God did not like that and he expected them to remove those groves. I think personally that this is probably something that Abraham shouldn't have done. I think he probably should have known, but I can't prove that, that he knew for sure that God did not want him to, to build a grove. But what happens is generally, I mean, people have these these, you know, these high places where they think they're going to get closer to God and they build these groves and they have these special areas, but it's not the way that God designed it. It's something that they've built out of their own heart and it leads them astray. And it's something that God doesn't like because it's not the way that he told them to worship him. Just like God's altars are stone and they're not supposed to be carved and, and with the work of men's hands. Or you can build a mound of dirt. Like th Those were the two options that they had for building an altar unto the Lord. And he's very specific about the way that it has to be. And God is always very specific about the way that he demands to be worshipped. When he wants things done his way, that's what he expects. And he doesn't accept anything else. And I don't believe he would accept a grove because it's always negative. So... You know, we see Abraham was human. Was he a great man of God? Absolutely. Was he a friend of God? Yes. Did he, did he have integrity? Of course he did. But did he make mistakes? Yes. He was also a sinner, just like all of us are. But, um, so hopefully you got to learn a little bit, um, especially with the, with the, the bond woman. And the, and the free son and going through Galatians 4 and stuff. Go, I would recommend reading those chapters again later on. L read them tonight or read them tomorrow when this is still kind of fresh in your mind because I didn't really do a lot of justice with all of the, um, all the things you could learn between Revelation 21, Galatians 4, Isaiah 54, and Genesis. All the places that we went to that tie together. There is a lot of connections to make. And I did a real light job of that just for sake of time. We had a lot of things to go over. But um, I, I definitely, I, I picked up quite a bit going through that stuff, even just in preparation for the sermon tonight. So I would recommend, if you have the time, write those, those references down and read them later on your own and, and really look at all the similarities and stuff. And I think you'll learn a lot more. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the depth of the Bible, that it's not just some simple book, dear God, but um, it's just infinitely deep and there's so much wisdom and there's so much to learn. And it's so perfect, dear Lord, that um, with all of the various references and in, in the, in the, in the, the flow and in the, in the ideas being taught, for your words to have spanned thousands of years in their in their being written down and, and being um, given unto us, dear Lord, to have such a magnificent 
Um, way that, that your words fit together and the perfection of it is astounding, dear Lord, that, that everything is molds together so completely without any contradiction, without any errors, without any problems, dear Lord. It truly is an amazing thing. I pray that you would please help us to study our Bibles more, to look up all these references, and to be able to learn all that you have for us to learn from your word, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.